Did you actually decide to do what you're doing musically in that sense? Because, and if you study art, or you, you, and you, you, there's kind of like a broad area which you cover, and there's so many things, so many avenues you could go down. And yeah. were you all agreed right from the word go where it was going to go musically? Was uh, this... No, we, we have no idea where we're going. There's no one, no one's manning the ship. Um, we just started because uh, it was fun, and you know we just wanted to have a laugh. Really, we didn't take ourselves seriously. We had no idea about. We didn't think we were going to make a career out of it. We just thought, this is fun, let's do it. And then I guess we reached the point where probably in South by Southwest when we had, you know, lots of labels chasing us, wanting to sign us, that it kind of felt, right, OK, well, this is, uh, this is about to become a, a job now. Right. And do you think that, I mean, up to now, I mean, on, the, on both the albums, you, you managed to retain a sense of fun. Yeah. but also d develop a sense of depth as well. I mean, is that something which you kind of consciously have to... It's like a balancing trick, because... Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, subconsciously or consciously, I don't know, but, I mean, I think I wanted to um, do a slightly weightier album. Some of the songs on the first album sound uh, really happy and carefree, but the underlying um, messages or, you know, they're not very happy at all, really. Um, so... I guess maybe I wanted to put that more in the fro in the forefront, or well, we all did really. Do you think that most people are aware of the fact that the songs weren't all that happy, really, deep down? No. Do you think no. people just took it at face value? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> and was that something which you were upset about in any way? Do you think? I mean, do, um, do people didn't really understand or grasp you fully? Not upset, but maybe a touch frustrated. But then I, I can't. I don't know. You can't really. Um, the, 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 you, you can't really uh, persuade people to listen to music like that. I guess the only thing you could do is kind of write a, a power ballad about antidepressants, really, and that's that's fairly. Uh... Wombats proudly present this modern glitch. Uh, I mean, it must have been like a conscious decision to have more keyboards in there, like synthesizers and stuff like that. Um, did it seem did it seem important to you to kind of keep up with the times? Because that that's in a, in a sense is like the sound of now. Uh, maybe yeah. more than the first album was. Um, do you think you kind of unconsciously m move along in terms of the sound of now, or is that is that more of a conscious thing to go? Well, let's we've got to make sure that we actually fit in with the times. I think. Well, no, we don't. We don't. We don't. Don't think about that. I guess um, the synths and the keyboards, etc. That was just um, a byproduct of being pretty. You know, we didn't want to do a, a guitar, bass, and drums album. It wasn't. It wasn't exciting us, so we, you know, if there was um, a ukulele or something and, and we played that and that we got good energy or, you know, got excited by it, then there would have been a, a uke album, but there right. was a... Well, might be the next album. Since we're closer to okay. hand. And who's going to play the synths on stage, then? Because only three of you on there. Yeah. So how do you get about that, then? Um, we have these things called Muse receptors, um, which are unbelievable, really, but... Basically, I can play one note on a keyboard, but I'm actually playing about three or four different ones at the same time. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we've got sample banks that all kind of go on to one. Okay. So we've kind of had to embrace technology a bit with this album otherwise. You yeah. didn't take a famous keyboard with you on tour? You didn't take Rick Wakeman or somebody with you? No, 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 no. No, it's just the three of us. All right. Yeah. And do you think it's of relevance, the fact that it's just uh, the three of you? I mean, do you think there's a, a special kind of dynamics about just being three? I mean... A lot of people have four or five, obviously. Yeah. I mean, was that, again, a conscious decision to keep it down to three? Do you think it, there is something special about that for you? Yeah, I guess so. I think it would be easier with a fourth member a little bit, but um, we like a... We love a good struggle. <laughs> so you just can't get somebody to join the band then? To, no, to I don't, I, it'd be weird, I think. Well, there was four of us in, uh, uh, when we started. A guy called Ben, who he moved back to um, L.A., and then when he left, we, the songs that we had, his parts were missing, so we just, um, Dan and Todd sang them instead, and that's where all the harmonies came from. It was basically Ben's guitar parts that we were singing, and then I guess that's where all the wooing did. The you come from Liverpool, um, do you think that is something which has, do you think that kind of accompanies you all through the years now, or is it something which is only really of, of relevance and importance to begin with as a starting point? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, I guess it is part of our identity. And if it wasn't for Liverpool, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be musicians because the music scene in Liverpool, it's so helpful and supportive. 
if you've got half a song, almost broken guitar amp, someone is going to put you on and give you a gig and give you some free drinks for the for the pleasure. And so that's how you started with half a song, yeah, without a broken, a broken string. Kind of, yeah. W- without people like that, then there would be no good bands from Liverpool. Right. Um, so I guess yeah, it's very important to us. And obviously, that's a rich musical heritage, and we're very proud of it. Yeah. And there's a lot of self belief in Liverpool, isn't there, still? I mean, don't you think? I mean, we come musically in the terms of. I mean, sometimes I think that in other parts of the world, in Germany, for example, that bands sometimes don't make it, although they actually have a lot of artistic potential just because they're not confident enough to just have. Uh, the self esteem is yeah. not high enough. Yeah. And maybe, you know, the Liverpoolians have always been regarded as having bags of that, haven't they? To excess yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's true. Um, Do you, have you always had that. bags of self confidence? Oh, I have absolutely no self-confidence. <laughs> um, it's just something that singing or playing songs, it doesn't... It's just something that I um, do to vent frustration, I think, really. I don't really think of myself as a performer or... I don't know. I don't really think of... Yeah, I just... It's just a, a, a way to get stuff out. Yeah, do you actually not think in, in terms of artistic merit when you actually written songs about how good are your songs you know, faced up to something else which you've heard um, faced um, up to uh, does that come into the equation at all are you, only, you just... in, only in post really not whilst writing I think I just think about trying to convey um, well it's getting quite heavy trying to convey what I feel into words and somehow make sense of it all but I guess afterwards I'll listen to a song and go, well, is that as good as, um, you know, Sex on Fire by the Kings of Leon or whatever? But that only happens afterwards. If I did that at the time, I'd go a bit insane. You compare everything to Sex on Fire by the Kings of Leon. <laughs> no, no, no. Just, yeah. <laughs> That's kind of the ultimate track. Yeah, ever. it's a big song, yeah. In the history of the world. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've only made two albums. It seems astonishing to me that you've made so many so obvious sort of classic anthems in the space of a couple of albums other people may just have one in a lifetime yeah. and you've got about ten already uh, well, I mean, it's it, very kind of you to say yeah but I mean it just the, you know, the, the instant floor fillers the um, you know the, the stuff which people kind of hold close to their hearts and that we're going to have a timeless quality like in I think like yeah. in ten years time people will still be listening to Let's Dance to Joy Division you know, because yeah. it's just something and uh and I mean, just sort of these brilliant lines, like celebrate the irony, stuff like that. People are just gonna, it, it kind of, you're not going to forget those kind of lines. Yeah. And it, it must be incredibly difficult keeping up your own standards in that respect. I could imagine being a nightmare, surely. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I guess trying not to look back is, is, is kind of what it is. And especially, well, for our second album, that was kind of my goal was, well, our goal was to try and write a better song than Let's Dance to Joy Division. Like that was, I think that was the kind of mindset and then as soon as we stopped thinking like that then those kind of songs came out more naturally yeah because the thing is when being a radio DJ obviously part of my job is just listening to lots and lots of music and looking for those songs which are a bit special which yeah. are a bit, you can sometimes spend hours looking for them and then when you actually find one and you think well all the waiting's been worthwhile but um, there are quite a few on your albums and um once you've actually managed to to write a song, like Techno Fan, for example, as well, I mean, is, is it just immediately clear to you? Well, you know, we've just accomplished something really good now. Or no. just, it was only in hindsight, do you think? Or not yeah, even the, now. There was two. There was two songs. I remember when we recorded Techno Fan. There was another song, and I was really excited about the other one. I wasn't that kind of. I thought Techno Fan was good, and it was like strong and solid. But I was really excited about the other one. The other one didn't end up on the album, and then. Our A and R guy like called me up and was like screaming at me down the phone when he heard Techno Fan and I guess um, I think I trust his judgment quite a lot. So yeah. just oblivious to your own quality sometimes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Do you think that when you actually write songs that the best songs are written when you feel like a, an emotional wreck sort of thing? I mean, um... Yeah. Yeah, I found there was times on uh, the second album where I was a little bit too kind of happy or relaxed to really write a good song so I'd kind of destruct myself a little bit I'd kind of self-destruct or do something a bit weird or with techno fan I I went out to this illegal techno rave in Shoreditch and 
I only did it because I wanted I needed something different to write about or a different experience to draw from. Beim zweiten Album obliged to be kind of really buoyant on stage because it's a sort of music which ne needs the power and the energy behind it. And you sometimes find yourself in a scenario where the audience is in a better frame of mind than you are. I don't feel compelled to jump around. I don't really jump around that much in comparison to tours or anything, but it's you've um, got to sing as well, haven't you? Yeah. You start singing out a tune if you're jumping around too much. Yeah, yeah. Um and he uh, and I guess we kind of we get a little bit addicted to seeing other people dance. I don't know, it just feels natural really. And I'm I'm sure the sort of band that gets loads of of fan mail from people who claim that they can really identify with what you're saying in your songs because the thing is I mean you express yourself in terms that people are going to understand I yeah. think I think that's something which is good I mean it's one of the great one of the great tradition of working class British music the fact that it doesn't get over intellectual and people can actually no matter what kind of background they come from you know they can actually understand the message I think that's sort of really important I'm not saying it's simplistic but it's it's not to my mind uh Anyone with, with any kind of reasonable amount of intelligence is going to be able to understand what you're trying to convey. Yeah. It's not going to be cryptic. No, no, no. I just, yeah. The easiest way to connect, really. I don't... Yeah. I'm not into... Uh, we don't want to write the wastelands or any kind of, you know, something that's like a heavy text. We just want people to feel the same way we do. But have you found yourself in the kind of rather unfortunate role of having to be an agony ant for fans? Or... Um, occasionally. Uh, after anti D, but I guess that was you know, I put myself in that place for a reason anyway, didn't I? So I mean, yeah, yeah sometimes it, it's quite, it's quite bizarre. Or well, they think they think that I can help them, um, and you can't, and I can't, really? I can't even help myself. Why so. can't you help them? <laughs> You've written this. Yeah, yeah. There was someone the other night in Berlin. It was on a night out. It was like three in the morning, and she was kept talking to me about you know how unhappy she was and the drugs that she's taking and stuff and it was it was hard especially at 3 a.m. in the morning when you're shit faced <laughs> I can't believe it ich fühle mich nicht verpflichtet auf der Bühne and I can imagine it being really important for the Wombat fans to actually f feel connected to, to you and that you, they don't kind of regard you as being a, a kind of like a Bono sort of figure on a, on a pedestal somewhere yeah having more of a, a very kind of basic down to earth communication with them I mean do you think that could become futile if it became too commercially successful well it just becomes more difficult I think I mean I don't want to we don't want to have a smoke screen between us and the fans and where you know whenever we get a chance we'll go out and sign things or talk to people or hang out with them you know it's not uncommon for us to like be hanging around with some people backstage after a show and end up go out you know having drinks with them and stuff We like to keep as close as possible. I guess if things get bigger and uh, better, it's probably just uh, there's just going to be more of them. Actually, you remind me a bit of Marina in the Diamonds. I mean, obviously, you don't have a, a great deal of physical resemblance. Yeah, right. Thanks, Marina Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're much more good looking. Yeah. But um, <laughs> no, but I was talking to her, and uh, I met her a couple of times, and and she just basically does what she wants to do, irrespective of what people are going to think of her and it means that she kind of falls into the trap of uh, of not being really indie but not being really mainstream either yeah and so being too indie for the mainstream being too mainstream for indie i can imagine some people interpreting you in just the same way where yeah. there's a lot of talent there a lot of very good songwriting but where do you really fit in it is that necessary to really fit in? i mean she had a number five album so does it really matter you've had a number three album does it really matter does it really um, matter to you does it matter if you fall out with the enemy for example No, I mean, we've always kind of been lost in that, in the kind of the the chasm between indie and pop. And the more I think about it, the more I enjoy being there, and it means we can get away with more. And I don't know. I mean, of course we care what people think about us, but I'm not going to let you know some twenty year old living in a one bedroom flat um, tell me how crap my songs are. Because <laughs> I'm amazed that they actually think people care. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think the idea of mainstream isn't a frightening word, and I, I think I just I love big pop songs with weird lyrics. 
So I guess that's what we'll probably just keep on doing. Well, this is what I was saying about the comparison of the Marine and the Diamonds, you know, being mainstream but quirky at the same time. Yeah. And so I think that's got something... The difference with her, though, is that she has always been very careerist from an early age and was convinced that, that she's got to be really massive. That's her a, a true goal, where you, right. you kind of you kind of seem to have drawn a different picture, where you, you took you by surprise more than anything else, and you still haven't really come to terms with the surprise yet of it all. Yeah, no, that's true, yeah. I have no idea, yeah. I don't... Every day when we go on stage, it's always a bit of a kind of shock. It's like, oh, my God, what's going on here? We're not, we're not used to it. But that, that, that's a good thing. It also makes everything feel completely volatile and futile. I mean, we're on this really nice kind of tour bus now, but I don't really think of it as, like... I feel as though the next week this tour bus could be gone and I'm in McDonald's or something. So I guess we're just taking each second as it comes. One component of what you do is, is the vocals, because... And obviously you won't be a trained vocalist, will you? No, God, I wish I was. Um, well, you do wish you were, because don't you think you'd lose something if you were? <clears throat> well, I mean, I've gone for... I've had lots of uh, classes. Well, not, when I was in L.A., I went to see this guy called Ron Anderson, and he's, he does, like, you know, Christina Aguilera. He's been an opera singer, and he got me singing properly, but it doesn't sound like me. When you sing properly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so guttural that it, it sounds kind of... Sounds like Phantom of the Opera or something. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, because I am untrained, that's why I have so many problems with my voice. And taught, you know, playing an hour and a half uh, each night, singing for an hour and a half each night is takes its toll when you don't really know what you're doing. And can't you just take a few of the tricks you've been given as for training to actually, without actually sounding like Phantom of the Opera, I mean, without turning into Andrew Lloyd Webber? Only really like... kind of how to warm up and warm down properly, I guess. Right, okay. Uh, and then when I'm actually on stage, it's anyone's guess, I think. But it's interesting because the, the, the kind of the, the happy sound to the music in some ways belies the fact that um, the songs aren't really happy at all. But it obviously it underlines the fact that that is the ultimate, your ultimate goal, presumably. You know, you're striving to be happy, but yeah. not, not really getting there. Is yeah. that right? I guess so, yeah. I always think of like Dan and Todd as my kind of like psychotherapist. And when I bring a song in or whatever, and then they start playing on it, it just makes it sound so happy such a double-edged sword, uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you think you're ever going to make it, then? Make that, what? That stage of happiness, then? No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm happy on stage. That's that's all that, that's all that matters, I guess. I suppose it's important that all three of you have the thing you're actually all developing at the same pace together. Yeah. And it's not one of you going off in leaps and bounds and the one staying behind. I mean, yeah. That's important, isn't it? Yeah, I think we, 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 we work... We're a tight units, I think. Right. Well, that's probably the essence of it at the end of the day, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ich bin leider kein... OK, well, thanks very much for talking to me. I appreciate that. No problem. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks. Okay.